is an unspoiled network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering One Piece, episodes 103 and 104. 102 was deemed filler. In these episodes, well, it seems like Luffy is of the same mind that I am in terms of what's going on with Vivi, and he basically gives her a come to Jesus moment, and I appreciated it a lot. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everyone. I am Natasha. Thank you very much to Gabriella for commissioning this episode. Gabriella is here in the chat. Hi, girl. So, <laughs> this filler episode, guys, I just have to talk about it briefly because you know I do. I don't understand the, f- the thought process behind that episode. <laughs> Look, I totally understand the the intention but the whole thing is our crew basically goes off and kind of like does what they each want to do and that still equals teamwork and it's not that I don't agree that that can be the case at times but I don't agree that that is the case here I just feel like Nami climbing on a camel and being like, I'm sure they'll find a way to catch up isn't teamwork at all. And just because they wind up finding her because she's got faith that they will. Y'all, I'm just saying, as somebody who has been in the position where I have not been given tools because it is assumed that I'm competent enough to figure it out on my own. Yeah, maybe I did wind up figuring it out, but you could have helped me. You didn't have, like, what did it gain you to just do whatever you wanted? So I have an issue with that. And I do kind of appreciate that by the end of it, Zoro and Chopper are both low key. Like, I don't like this. It's treated as if, oh, look, Nami's faith in in Luffy was totally justified. She was right. He found them in the end. It's fine. And yet, Zoro and Chopper, I don't know if they are feeling the same way. Chopper, like, straight up says, I kind of wonder if I should have not come, or at least not come with you guys. And uh, considering how often I've mentioned that Luffy's incompetent, I think that my feelings on this are pretty clear and I sort of want there to be more growth in that area for him. I just want, I want Luffy to at least attempt to think about other people. He doesn't have to, like, this is something that we ran into for, uh, In Crazy Ex-Girlfriend, those of you who have seen that show, I'm going to reference it for two separate things in this episode. The first one is that what that show ran into was they were dealing with people who had mental health issues. And once people begin to solve those problems and work on them, they become less drama to watch. They're less fun to watch because they're not getting up to their crazy antics anymore because they're starting to become more stable. So with that in mind, I don't need Luffy to become a completely self-aware and giving person, but I would like it if it seemed as if he were making an attempt at all ever, just a, just a drop of growth. That's all I'm saying. Um, so the other thing I'm going to mention Crazy Ex-Girlfriend for is all of our super villains are meeting up at uh, the Spiders, Spiders Cafe, I think is what it's called. And this is another thing that just made me think of Crazy Ex-Girlfriend because there is a nightclub that she goes to. And the first time she goes there, there's it's Spiders with the apostrophe after the last S, which she's like, do they realize that that means that this club is owned by multiple spiders 
And then the next time she goes to the club, it's apostrophe S, like it's one spider. And it's just the kind of thing where every time she goes to the club, the apostrophe is in a different place. Like they just don't commit at all to what the name of the... So that was what I kept thinking of with this episode. Um, Gabriella says, see, you wanted it and Oda gave it to you. Vivi getting a wake, wake up call, I mean. Yeah, I was very gratified by this. I just needed Vivi, like, I understand completely wh where she's coming from, but if she's going to rule and she's going to be effective, she's going to have to start making some tough choices, man. That's how it works. That's why ruling is often not what it is cracked up to be. And that is why presidents end their terms looking 15 years older than they did when they began, because uh, that shit gets to you after a while um so all right let's let's back up here and we will talk about the start of this episode everybody is excited because vivi has promised them that the town that they're heading to is right around the corner that these rock this rock formation that they're seeing it's yuba is right past that and unfortunately, when they turn the corner, it turns out that Yuba is in bad shape. It got hit by a sandstorm. And while it is supposed to be an oasis, the water supply has been like kind of crushed. And it's interesting, later on, the, uh, the old man, whose name I think is Toto, is that right? who is the father of her friend who is now the leader of the rebellion, who apparently his dad does not approve of. Um, he is there trying to dig the place out. And this is another person. The other one was in the other filler episodes, but it was the girl who, uh, stayed in, in her village even after everybody else had left because she had such faith that Vivi and the king were going to figure shit out and save her. And this guy is in a similar place where he's just stayed behind even though literally nobody else has left. And this is just an odd thing. I think that this is the kind of thing that I don't understand as somebody who has never lived like under a monarchy and has never had faith in any system that it is going to be looking out for me. And I have never had that faith. And I still had more faith in that five years ago than I do now. So I'm at negative faith on that front. These people, this woman from the filler episode and Toto in this episode are being presented like it's sort of a virtue that they have such faith. And it's not, that's the end of the sentence. It's not, I don't understand. Like it is one thing to trust that somebody means well, or is going to attempt to make it right. It is another thing to stand in place, acting as if the tragedy that has happened hasn't happened at all or uh, trying to like bring things back to the way they used to be instead of accepting that things change and you know everybody is gone dude and I understand that you want to find this water but like even if you did that are you getting people to come back the place has been like completely obliterated buildings are broken it's buried in sand I really sympathize because this was your town and this sucks. But there comes a point where it's like being presented as faith and it really feels a lot more like ego. You know, it's just I this was mine and my name was attached to it and I can't accept that this happened. And I just don't really feel the virtue of that. It feels a lot more pitiful, honestly. Um, and I, at the end, he like manages to eke out a little bit of water. And it, it's like, 
and he gives it all to Luffy, who says, I'll be very careful in drinking it, which I was like, will you? Because that sounds out of character. Um, but I wanted the crew to convince him to come with them. I really was hoping that the way this was going to end was that he would accompany Vivi to where they were going and help her in her quest to make things right and be bear witness or, you know, like something. Um, and the fact that they just leave him there by himself, I, it was just very sad. And I don't know. It was interesting that it seemed as if that encounter was sort of what made Luffy stop and decide to say he quits. Um, but we will get there. I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself here. Um, Gabriella says, yeah, it's the tragedy of thinking in a way he failed, but still believing he can make it happen. Yeah. Maybe that's what it is. Is like, just it, it <laughs> this show is really big on like, have a dream and never let the dream go. And this is the sort of thing that I, used to under like I used to really subscribe to this idea because it's something that sort of shoved down kids throats to a degree that becomes really frustrating as an adult because we want to know why kids aren't being realistic and it's like well we spend their entire childhood telling them to reach for the stars and then wonder why they do that um but the the always like commit to your dreams and never let them go is the kind of thing that I think can be like extremely damaging actually, because like uh, for the one thing, sometimes dreams don't work out. It just, that is reality. And I understand that that's like the antithesis of what we're trying to, to what's the word I want nurture in people. But I don't think it's fair to behave as if just holding on forever means that you'll succeed eventually, which is, I think the message that gets sent is that if you just persevere and hold on and never ever give up, then eventually you'll beat your dream into submission and it will have to come true. And, uh, one, no, that does not have to happen. And two, sometimes holding on to something that you thought you wanted winds up getting in the way of what actually is potentially right in front of you. And that's the thing that I get the the saddest about is like, I think back to what I thought I wanted for a career and podcasting literally didn't even exist yet. And imagine if I got myself fixated on something and I never stopped pursuing that thing, even though it wasn't working out. And I would have missed out on this which is better than anything that I was pursuing and much more suited to me in, than anything else that I had tried. And if I had just single-mindedly gone after the one goal, I would never have room in my life for something like this. So that's the thing for me that's the, the biggest problem with it is like, if you do something to the exclusion of all else, what are you excluding? You don't know what you're excluding because you're excluding it. That's how it works. So just, I feel like it's very dangerous. Um, but yeah, it's, it's the sort of thing that I understand why the show is, is doing it. And I know that a lot of stuff geared towards kids has this message, but it, when it feels like everybody that they come across is, this really does seem to be the thing is like whenever they come across a new character that's going to be around for a little while, they have this weird dream that they have decided to commit themselves to. And as the show has gone on and on, it keeps happening and it feels like it's getting progressively less and less of a payoff. Like, Chopper's uh, boss, what was his name that wanted the 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 petals, the cherry tree thing? Like his whole dream was making the cherry tree bloom again. And then we like get the thing and it isn't actually really even what he claimed he was trying to do that happens. But we have to treat it like a big win, even though it's nothing. So I'm starting to get impatient with it. You know, I want 
if we're going to do the stick to a dream and pursue it no matter what, one, if we're not going to actually reach that goal, can we be honest about that and admit that we haven't reached it instead of pretending that we have when what's happening isn't the goal at all? We didn't cause cherry trees to bloom. We turned snow pink. That is not the same thing. It's not even close to the same thing. Let's stop pretending that it's the same thing. And this guy is just left behind in this abandoned town to keep digging for water. And it's like, well, Luffy dug so far that he got to a point where there was dampness in the soil. I guess. I think that's supposed to be treated as like it's an optimistic outlook that maybe his dream isn't so far fetched after all. And I'm like, a dude with literal superpowers had to show up and dig for you for you to find water. That's not a win. That's a cautionary tale. You need a person who is like superhuman to pull this off. That feels to me like it should be the red flag you need to indicate it's time to move on. But what do I know? So I just wanted to talk about that off the top because it's just keeps coming up and I have been frustrated with it. But every other time it's felt like, well, we're going to act as if it's we had a win here. And this one, I, I am guessing eventually the town will be rebuilt and we're going to, you know, say it's a win but as of right now, it just feels like kind of weird and sad. So uh, let's see. And Florian says, yeah, he could have gone too. Never thought of that, to be honest. Yeah, it's just like they just leave him there. Uh, Gabriella says they call it romance, the romance of dreams. First arc, Luffy's intro is romance dawn. Okay. Yeah, I guess I'm not a romantic. Who knew, everybody? Uh, here in Luke, thank you. Always forget his name. So, all right, just needed to talk about that. And it's funny because we go from like this town that has no water to then a literal aquarium, which I don't, I have to imagine that this is purposeful, but this place being full of so much water and just for like the aesthetic, just because I feel like having this to, prove how much fucking water I've got. It's super gross. Um, so we go to Crocodile and he is uh, talking with his, what is the name of the woman who's got the, the um, bangs and the very, very straight nose that he's talking to? I can't recall her name, but she's, uh, you know, the one that everybody has been in communication with pretty much. And she's telling him that she has scheduled the meet with everybody at Spider's Cafe. Um, the officers and agents are gathering and we get to see Spider's Cafe and see a couple of people show up. So we've got, what is it, Mr. Four? And... Uh, Miss Merry Christmas, I think is, are their names? And do, 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 Ms. All Sunday. Oh, is the, uh, the straight nose lady. Okay, cool. Thank you, Florian. I feel like you guys told me about the actual holiday behind that name, but I'm not remembering it. Um, <laughs> Miss Merry Christmas, guys. Uh, she sucks. <laughs> oh my God. She's like a four year old that had too much sugar. And it's like a four year old that had too much sugar combined with like a real Karen type where she is just insufferable. Everything that she wants, she wants immediately. She has no patience. She speaks really fast. She demands everything be prepared and ready to go. And the partner that she's paired with is like a guy who speaks so slowly that she 
I don't understand how they even function as a team because she walks in like long before he actually gets to the door of the bar. And if that's just how they're behaving, coming to this meeting, how do they function the rest of the time? You know, like, how are they able to work together, physically work together when they are so completely like off kilter with one another? Um, Florian says, I hate that. I also hate Christmas. So it fits. I love Christmas. And because I saw that Miss Merry Christmas was going to be a fat woman and I'm a fat woman, I was like, oh, maybe this will be cool. And she is just the absolute, absolute worst. I just, uh, it's like a combination. She could be somebody who talks really fast and, and is like somewhat impatient without being as cruel as she is. Like, you know, she's talking to the bartender who is, what is her name? Miss Double Fingers? What is Double Fingers? Is that a holiday? I thought that was a weird name. Um, but we don't know that that's who she is right away. But anyway, she's talking to her and the woman is like, um, how's your job going? I think is all she asks is just a really innocuous question. And Miss Merry Christmas is like, if you're not good at your job, you're dead. So the fact that I'm alive should be answer enough, you stupid woman, you idiot. And I'm just like, uh, wow, dude, that's like just super unnecessary. Why are you, what? Just chill out a little bit here. Um, so yeah. anyway, yeah, that's, uh, that's not... I'm I'm not looking forward to seeing more of her. I will say though, guys, I'm jumping ahead a little bit here. I am so in love with Mr. Two. I just love him so much. He it, like I know that a lot of the tropes are that he's displaying are super offensive and it's meant to play on a lot of like bigotry and he's being called a freak and all this stuff. Like I know it's ugly, but overall I am super bummed that he's a bad guy because I just want him to like join the straw hats and be a weirdo with them because they're all weirdos. They really are, you know? And I feel like in a weird way, he could fit in somehow because he doesn't seem that bonkers in a way that's like, he doesn't seem harmful, even though he's out here clearly must be like he's a supervillain, he's doing crazy shit, but it doesn't seem like he's a vindictive person who just like enjoys it. I... Like, he's teaching these dudes to dance and pirouette and everything and, like, walks away and he's like, don't forget to practice. And then when he gets in that fight with, is it Mr. One that he's fighting? And he holds his own. He's dancing and, like, twirling around on his toes. But he dodges that shit and he lands a blow and he's in his fucking toe shoes I mean, I am all about it. At one point, he says something like dancing and something and mascara are like the three, you know, principles of being one of his dudes. And it is, in my opinion, the right attitude. You know, like, I I see nothing wrong with that as your mantra. That feels good to me. All, all in all, I really think I would rather spend the day with him than most people on this show. I mean, most of my friends are as extra as he is. So I guess that makes sense. But you know what I mean? Like, I'm just I really, really enjoy him a lot. And I am I'm, I'm already sad that eventually I assume he's going to have to be taken out because each of these dudes is going to have to be like defeated somehow um, I'm saying that like, maybe not, maybe it doesn't work that way, but I'm anticipating that's how it's going to work. And I'm already sad about it. So I'm just going to try and enjoy him as much as I can while I can. So 
yeah, these people show up. Um, and the dude, I should mention that one of the dudes that's dancing with Mr. Two is, uh, he has hair that's like a bat's wings. It's a a weird look that's almost pigtails, but it's like not exactly. And I think, I guess maybe it's supposed to be like the wings of a bird. Like he's doing the swan theme. Um, yeah, this, this is a, the, the hairstyles of these dudes are really wild. Um, and eventually we see this guy come back because Mr. One has decided to pick a fight and he says something to Mr. Two about how basically if you're fostering friendships, all you're doing is making yourself weaker, which, um, this is, I think part of why I assume this dude, Mr. Two would fit with the straw hats is because he's like reaching out and making friends and creating a team that just feels so much within the straw hats, like alleged approach to life that I can't help but be like, well, yeah, the guy just wants like friends to hang out with. I feel like that would work. Um, so this dude had like beat up some of his guys and for like no reason other than to make a point, which truly what are you doing? These people are supposed to be on your side. Like why bother? But they get into a whole fight and have to be sort of talked down. And eventually they move from the cafe to this huge casino in the city. Uh, Rain base, I think is what it's called. Um, And it turns out, we find out later that Mr. Three has hitched a ride and is like hanging on to the back of the coach that they're all in. Ooh, sorry guys. I kicked my little space heater I have down here. Um, so they don't expect to see him again. And he turns up and I had forgotten about the whole thing with Sanji and that he was on that call and that crocodile thought he was speaking to Mr. Three. So I completely forgot that Mr. Three or um, that crocodile assumes our whole crew is dead. They, I, I don't know why I forgot. That's what he's thinking. And because he had, I had like given Vivi a lot of shit for sending that note ahead of them to her dad that her and all of her friends were coming. And honestly, I still stand by it because if you think that there are spies in the palace, it's just for me, why would you do this? But considering that they are all assumed dead, presumed dead, I guess it's like slightly better. I don't know if she's aware that they're presumed dead though. How much of this did Sanji tell them all all about? Um, I have a lot of questions on that, but anyway, so we're going to go back to our crew for a little bit and, uh, pretty much I've talked about like most of what goes on within the episode, the first episode with like needing water. Um, and when she, Vivi realizes who this guy is, we have a little bit of a flashback, um, and, you know, she is saying goodbye to her friend, um, Kuza. Is that his name? I'm sorry, guys. I know I keep forgetting people's names, but he is saying goodbye to her. And then we like cut to a dude who's clearly him as an adult. And he's got these little glasses on and a very pensive expression. And, uh, I am honestly pretty into it. Uh, he is, I don't know. He's got like a no nonsense energy and his outfit is like sort of badass, but also kind of basic in a way that I appreciate for a revolutionary. Koza. Thank you, Gabriella. Um, And overall, I just, I don't know. I like it. He's got a sort of energy to him that I'm into. I'm here for it. Might be the scarf. Scarf can really do a lot, you know? Um, but yeah, 
I his father does not approve of him, I guess, because he was real mad when they ask if the revolutionaries or the rebel army are in this town. He like flips out and just starts chucking things at them. And I was like, there is no need for that, sir. How about you just like talk to them for a moment? Um, <laughs> so we start off the next episode with all of them in an inn and they're all pillow fighting. And at one point, Vivi gets smacked in the face with a pillow and Nami looks down at her with a little bit of concern and sees that Vivi is smiling and uh, seems almost touched by the fact that they are all fighting with each other. And it was just sort of a cute moment, like just, you know, expecting this girl to be like, what the fuck, guys? And instead she's like, oh, I'm part of this weird family now, you know, so. Then we have the uh, Luffy digging scene where the dude is like, you're not helping. You're just filling in the hole that I've been making. Why are you doing this? Please listen to me. He gives them some water and they are <laughs> after everything. Like there's so much in the filler episodes that we didn't see of Luffy miss like leading our people astray or getting separated or whatever. At this point, they are walking out of this town and Luffy just stops and sits under a tree and says, I quit. And I can't blame them all for just kind of being over it with him because he has caused so much trouble already. Um, and Vivi asks him what's wrong. And he says, I quit and doesn't elaborate at all. Everybody is just kind of like, what, what do you, what does that even mean? And, uh, Sanji tries to grab Luffy up and he just tosses him aside and then says, Vivi, I want to kick Crocodile's ass. You know that that's like all I've been thinking about, but if we stop the people from rebelling, will that even stop him? And we won't be able to do anything in Kataria anyway. We're pirates. Things are usually better off without us around. And I was kind of like, what exactly does that? Things are better off without us around. Like, I, once he gets to the point in a minute, you want it so nobody dies in this fight. And none of the, none of the citizens and none of us. But apparently it's fine if you die, even though we're up against the warlord of the sea and a million people, you just hope everybody's going to be safe and sound. And that is not how it's how it works. You're too soft hearted. But when he first says we're pirates, things are better off without us around. I wasn't entirely sure what he meant by that, because like. I mean, he has gone into one town after another, low-key saving people. So why does he think that? And, like, everybody around is agreeing with him? Like, I think Sanji says something like, oh, he, he has a, a way of really getting straight to the point right after that particular sentence. And I was like, I don't see it, you guys. Like, yeah, you call yourselves pirates, but that's not actually like how you function. And I've been talking about that. It's clearly pirates mean a different thing in this universe. So if they mean a different thing, what does that mean exactly? Um, and so Nami starts to yell at him and say, like, you could at least show some sympathy. And I was like, well, that's the thing. He has sympathy. Like, he gets that. Nobody wants people to be hurt on their behalf or in defense of something that belongs to them, which is how Vivi sees this country. Um, she's like, what's wrong with not wanting people to die? And it's like, well, that's not that's not the problem. It's that you refuse to acknowledge that it is an inevitability. You're going to go to war. And if all you can focus on is trying to lessen the harm that is done, you're not going to be focusing on the actual objective 
because you're going to be too busy attempting to mitigate damage. And that's not to say that you shouldn't be attempting to find methods of approaching the war that lessen the number of casualties and destruction. But like, you have to be honest that it's going to happen. And all you can do is find a way to minimize it. There's no way to sidestep it entirely. And uh, yeah, when he says, well, people die, she slaps him and sends him flying and says, stop talking like that. Say that again, and I'll make you pay for it. That's exactly what we're trying to stop here. The people of this kingdom, the rebel army, the royal army, none of them have done anything wrong. Why should they have to pay for it when this is all Crocodile's fault? And Luffy punches her in the face in response. I mean, I guess. <laughs> There's something about yelling at her that she's too soft hearted and letting her punch him in the face that made me think that he was like trying to let her access her angry side. I thought what he was attempting to do was like awaken some rage in her and make it so that she was more interested in fighting and like you know, putting, b being ready to like risk it all. But then he punches her in a way that I was like, oh, okay. I thought he was just sort of making himself into a punching bag. Like he was provoking her and he fought back. And I was like, oh, okay. I had this wrong. So he punches her back. And that's when he says, but it's fine for you to risk your life. I, I, I just, uh, one look at this kingdom, and even I can tell. And she starts punching him as he says what most needs to be done. What it needs the most. Um, Yuba can't be beaten by sand. And putting your single life on the line can't be enough. And she says, what should I be putting on the line then? This is all I've got. I can't let them get away with this. I don't have anything else to put on the line. And he says, what about our lives? What about us? Aren't we friends? I thought we were friends. And this is so funny to me because guys, again, I really thought that we had already done this. I didn't think by the end of this that all we were going to do was get to the point where she agreed to put their lives on the line. I thought we had already done that. She is already on board with Luffy fighting Crocodile. That's, she has to know that's Luffy risking his life, right? That dude, Crocodile, is the, the head honcho of an organization of extremely powerful people that she has to realize what he was risking by coming here and planning to do that. No? What did she think was happening there? Like... So this, I found this scene so frustrating because on the one hand, Luffy is telling her all the shit that I was basically saying in the last episode, but the conclusion that they come to is one that I had thought we'd reached already. And that because it, it's just to do with the people that she's with and her, the new friends she's made, that was a foregone conclusion to me that they are going to be part of this fight. She's attempting to keep everybody else out of it as well, though, and that is impossible. And that isn't really addressed here. And I don't know, it just felt like, I feel like we've had the same conversation with Vivi like three times now. And every time it's like, 
treated as this major moment of her being surprised at the fact that they are willing to risk themselves like this. And every time I'm like, didn't we do this? I thought we just did this. Um, Florian says Vivi never wanted to fight Crocodile like in a real fight. I mean, she wants to, but that would cost lives. So it isn't her way. Well, I know she didn't, but I thought she knew that Luffy planned on it. I thought that she, like, I thought she was bringing him here to do that. I mean, it's meant, it's been talked about in even earlier in the previous episode, I think when, or maybe it's, no, I think it's the uh, episode that was the filler episode. Nami says something to Vivi about like, you know, he's definitely going to find his way to us because he is too fixated on kicking Crocodile's ass. And so it's been explicitly said, and yet it's treated like that this is some sort of shock. I don't know. It's a weird thing. And like, I do appreciate the aren't we friends because this is one of those things that this happens a lot in the, the early books of the Dresden Files, for those who have read that. Um, he is constantly keeping people at arm's length because he thinks that he's protecting them. And they keep getting hurt because of the fact that he's not letting them into his circle and they aren't he isn't giving people the information they need to protect themselves because he's trying to assume all the responsibility and it keeps biting him in the ass and he starts to eventually learn his lesson and begin to trust people and tell them you know but initially he tries to be a, you know a one man island i guess as they say um but it just i don't know it was weird because like I wanted to be more touched by this moment, but it just felt really repetitive. And I can't understand what she thought was going to happen, considering the number of times they have talked explicitly about Luffy fighting Crocodile. I, what, I, don't, I don't know what she thought they were heading there to do. Um, so, yeah, that, this scene um is interspersed i guess i should is the word i want with uh scenes of crocodile and his people talking at the casino and what they do is they give us a taste of the fact that he has a bigger plan in play but they use the cigars that he's smoking as like a marker for how much time has passed. So he like lights one, tells them, let me explain to you all what's going on here. And then cut to outside the building, back inside, there are like four cigars in the ashtray. I can only imagine how, how horrible it smells in that room. And he's finished up and they're all going wait so that's what this was all about you think that even exists on this island so there is something here that he is after is it the one piece is it something completely other and separate we haven't talked about the one piece in a while so i don't know if you know that's even on the radar for things right now um but even if it were, I'm not entirely sure how that would help him get it. Because what he's trying to do is he is attempting to use the all of his like subordinates to um, what do you call it? Instigate the rebellion, right? He says, these letters are your final or orders. At last, the time has come for the Alabasta kingdom to disappear. Once each of you has fulfilled your mission, um, the, this kingdom will wreck itself. And with nowhere to go, the rebel and royal armies will tragically fall into Baroque works hands. In a single night, this land will truly become our utopia. 
And again, don't know exactly what that looks like or what that means. I'm I like, what is it that he's after? Has he told them the truth is the other thing. Because I if if there is supposed to be something on this island that is valuable. This man is no fool. I don't see him telling his subordinates about it unless it is something that he has full confidence they will never find, that they'll never be able to operate on their own, perhaps. Maybe it's something that wouldn't work with one person overseeing it. So he like needs other people's help. There, there are so many reasons to not share this information that I have to assume there's a very, very compelling reason to tell them. And I can't help but think his assertion that we're all going to like run this island and as a utopia together, that doesn't feel like how it's really going to go. This doesn't strike me as a man who's excited about sharing an island with people. He has operated without any of them ever seeing his face until today. And I just feel like they have, they are all going to be used and then thrown out once they're done. And none of them seems aware that that is likely in their future. Honestly, though, Baroque works being as huge as it is. I can understand when you're as high up the food chain as these guys are, why you would sort of like fall into complacency and really believe that you're safe, which is clearly a bit of an issue with Mr. Three. This dude rolls up on in here like a goddamn fool. I, I, I truly cannot believe the extent of the folly here. So he rolls in and he's like, oh, hey, what's up? I know that you wanted to kill me, but I'm here to beg forgiveness and a second chance. But the thing is that he doesn't beg forgiveness. He says that he's here to beg forgiveness, but he keeps up this fucking attitude like he has nothing to worry about. And it's just a foregone conclusion that he'll be given another opportunity, which is already presuming a lot, my friend. And then it turns out that he thought Crocodile was aware that all of the people Mr. Three had been sent to kill got away. So Mr. Three, I, I think, was working under the assumption that Mr. Two was sent to kill him because he failed his own mission. But it it's not. He was sent to kill Mr. Three because what was it, guys? Was it just because Mr. Three had like served his purpose or was it, was there something else going on there? Why did he at, want Mr. Two to kill Mr. Three? So, he shows up really thinking that if he swears he's able to like succeed in this mission, that he'll be given another chance. And what I find kind of funny is like, if you had just gone ahead and tried to like fulfill your mission on your own and then showed up and have like, they'd all been killed once you had succeeded that might have worked. I don't think it probably would have because as it turns out, Crocodile already thought these people were dead and he still wanted Mr. Three dead. But if you're Mr. Three and you don't know that, I, that's how I would do it is I would try to finally reach my goal on the DL and not draw attention to myself in this fashion. So, and Mr. Two, for his part, jumps up from the table and is ready to try and throw down with Mr. Three right there. Which, uh, got to admire the dedication, you know, he's just like, ah, good. An opportunity for me to fucking fix this thing. So <laughs> Crocodile, first of all, annoyed that three has found his way here, despite the fact that this meeting was supposed to be secret, annoyed that three heard all of his plans because he was clearly like out in the hall listening to the entire fucking presentation and PowerPoint that he did. And 
Of course, lastly, these people that he had assumed were out of the equation are still alive and not only alive, but on the island. Worst case scenario. So what he does is he goes right on up to Mr. Three and grabs him by the throat and begins to suck the life out of him. This is such a wild moment because nobody knew what his power was, which I didn't realize. I thought when everybody saw his face that they put two and two together about, because like he has not been secret about his power. We saw him like come in and take down that one pirate and dry them all up into like husks and walk away. Everybody saw what he did. So I had just assumed all of his crew, once they saw his face and realized who he was, that they knew he could do this. And I guess not because they all are like, what the fuck is happening to this guy? He doesn't even kill Mr. Three. That's the part that I'm like, this is cruel and unusual. So he partially dries him out so that Mr. Three is begging for water. And he says, do you, do you know why I gave you rank as he's doing this? In terms of fighting, even Mr. Four outclasses you, Mr. Three. It's because of the underhanded, contemptible tenacity you have to accomplish your duties. You've let me down. And this is when he begins to turn into like partial mummy and is begging for water. So he says, have all the water you want and presses a button like a fucking Bond villain so that a trap door opens up. And Mr. Three is dropped into the like aquarium area at the bottom of like underneath the meeting room. Guys, I have to ask. So he's standing there and he's like looking through the glass and says like, it's almost like an aquarium. And then he turns around and he says a banana gator. A banana gator? Is that right? Is that right? That's what the subtitle says. Is because the man's name is Crocodile. So I was assuming that the animal he would use to execute people would be a crocodile. I know that seems weird. But I just thought that's what it would be. Not only is it not a crocodile, it's not even like a banana dial. It's not even something that has a croc crocodile. It's it's nothing crocodile. It's an a, a complete. Uh, why? I want to know why you could have named him anything. What you could have had him be like partnered up with any animal. Why, why, why would you, why would it not be a crocodile? Why wouldn't you do that? That's just a weird choice. It's inexplicable for me. It, it, it was such a given Oh, look at the crocodile swimming around because his name's Crocodile in the background. And then he looks up and says, a banana gator. And I straight up paused it and rewound. And part of me was like, did they do this as a joke? Like, is it a joke that he thinks it's the wrong animal because he's so stupid that he didn't put two and two together? Or is it supposed to be a joke in and of itself that crocodile works with banana gators instead of other crocodiles? Like, 
I don't know. Everybody's talking about how they're their favorite creature. Florian says, in my mind, when they're young, they're green and old ones are brown. Oh, my God. And the adult ones are yellow. I just don't. I, I found this surprising. It doesn't matter. But it does, though. Doesn't it? Like, am I the only one who assumed that these were crocodiles can anybody like i just want to know that i'm not crazy that's all it was just it was something that i just assumed to such a degree took for granted that like i said i had to stop and rewind because i was like i had to have misheard that gabriella says you're overthinking it i mean i'm not though they're overthinking it they are they could have just done the same animal as his uh, but they didn't. So this isn't me overthinking it. They are the ones. Doesn't matter. But it does. But it doesn't. But it does. So he gets eaten. And Crocodile comes back and just is like, well, this fucking guy has ruined things. And I just tried to kill him and he's still not dying, which it has very like, you shot me. You shot me right in the arm energy from uh, Austin Powers but uh, then he's like "All right, well these guys are bent on stopping the rebellion so if we leave them alone they will just come to us and Mr. Two is like okay look granted that she's the princess but do you think that she could actually stop the rebellion things have really gotten on a roll and he knows about Vivi's connection with the leader of the rebellion. And it's like, she probably could get him to pull back because even like they know each other and she could at least confuse things if she doesn't outright stop them. I've already had many billions join their ranks. The fact that there's been no word from them must mean they still haven't taken any direct action yet. Whatever the cost, Vivi and the rebel army must not be allowed to make contact before the operation. And he says, Miss All Sunday. And I, guys, I have to mention this. <laughs> so Miss All Sunday, I wish I could screen share with you guys. She is standing there with her perfectly straight, very like pronounced nose. Her white cowboy hat very straight dark hair and what looks like almost like a cowboy style jacket with like a fur collar and guys all i could think of is if you have seen parks and rec you know the dude who says the worst he has a sister on that show whose name I cannot fucking remember, but this girl looks so much like Miss All Sunday. And there is an amazing moment in Parks and Rec where her brother, actually, I think both of them faked their own deaths because they're trying to get their own insurance money or they own money or something. But they can't resist going to their own funerals because they just want to see what kind of party gets thrown. And so they're like peeking around a tree at the graveside. And her and her brother are like, shh, stop it. No, stop it. You're being suspicious. Don't be suspicious. Don't be suspicious. Don't be suspicious. Don't be suspicious. And they start like dancing and forgetting where they are until they're spotted. And because everybody here is all in this nefarious game, but they are all such over the top people, it just fits really well for me as, as this dude named fucking Crocodile is telling everybody like, all right, we're pulling this really subtle sort of, don't be suspicious. Don't be suspicious. Like, hmm. It's just pretty, I want, if this is ever, oh, they are making a live action, huh? 
Well, if they haven't cast Miss All Sunday, which I'm assuming they haven't, because this is pretty far into the run, she should be cast. She would be fucking perfect. I would love it. Anyway. Um, so yeah, the, in the end, he uh, assigns Miss All Sunday. Um, let's use some transponder snails and contact the billions. Tell them to kill these guys on sight. And don't let her into Kataria or the pirates, Vivi or the pirates. Um, Vivi and Koza must not be allowed to meet. And she's just like, okay, and takes off. And that is the end of the meeting. And uh, pretty much jumping ahead to our friends, we already like ended that section with uh, Vivi it, like crying and being like, all right, I guess I'm willing to put all of you guys on the line. Can I just say how much I love Zoro standing off to the side with his eyes closed like he's sleeping standing up? Like, he just cannot be bothered with any of this. Zoro is so over it all the time. <laughs> he's so irritated all the time. It is so funny. Oh, my God. He's just like, <sighs> yeah, I'm just going to grab a nap once she's done having her fucking crisis existential crisis just like alert me and i will wake up and i'll be ready to go but i just don't like she's out here trying to lead this shit and she doesn't want people to die i'm out but i i can't i'm sorry honestly i'm feeling you more and more zoro seeing eye to eye on some things i gotta say all right i'm going to have to uh oh, Kyle says if the live action Cowboy Bebop is any indication, I wouldn't get your hopes up. Kyle. Shh. <laughs> Gabriella said shh. Well, honestly, I don't really understand the desire to make live actions of everything. I truly don't feel like it's a, like, it doesn't feel meaningful. You know, I don't understand it. So if it doesn't work out, I'm not going to be like mad about it. It It's more baffling to me that they've decided to do it. I could understand if they were going to like maybe do an extension of a different side story with the same characters, but it seems like they're remaking the show unless I'm misunderstanding. It doesn't matter right now, but because they only just did the casting a few months ago, right? So I don't know if they're even filming yet because of COVID. Um, but anyway, all right. I really do have to wrap. But thank you again, Gabriella, for commissioning this episode. Thank you all for hanging out with me in the chat and bearing with me, even though I can't believe it's banana gators. <laughs> That's the new I can't believe it's not butter. And I will see you guys next week or later this week, actually, with a new episode. Until then, toodaloo, motherfuckers. Spoiled Network Podcast.